Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts Channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's episode, we discover the story and the identity of the Lady of the Dunes. It's July 26th, 1974, and 12-year-old Leslie Metcalf was enjoying a nice day with her family. They were walking with the family beagle in the dunes, about a mile from the beach, at Cape Cod National Seashore in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Suddenly, the dog caught the scent of something and took off further into the brush. Leslie followed and soon saw what she thought at first was a deer. As she drew closer, she and her family could see that it was the body of a woman who was clearly deceased. When the police arrived, they found that the woman was nude, face down on a green beach towel. Her head rested on a pair of folded Wrangler blue jeans. A blue bandana was under her head, which had been nearly severed from the rest of her body. Her hands had also been removed. A pile of pine needles were at the ends of each arm. An autopsy showed that the woman was in the dunes for at least a week, maybe more. She had died from a blow to the left side of her head. The coroner stated that her hands and the injuries to her neck were conducted with an instrument similar to a military entrenching tool. Without her hands, no fingerprints could be taken to help identify her. When her teeth were examined, it was found that she had $10,000 worth of gold teeth and dental work that was described as being in the New York style of the time. There were no defensive wounds, indicating that she either knew her attacker or was incapacitated quickly, possibly being attacked while she slept. She was between 20 and 40 years old and stood between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 8 inches tall. She weighed about 145 pounds and had auburn hair that had been secured in a ponytail with a gold-flecked hair tie. Her toenails were painted pink. The only thing investigators knew for sure was that she had been posed on the dunes to look like a sunbather. When it came to the crime scene, investigators found very little. There was blood in the area of her body, but not enough for her life to have been taken there. They believed that she had been killed somewhere else. Motels and boarding houses were checked in an effort to find the woman's identity. Thousands of missing women reports were reviewed, and every vehicle that was licensed to drive on the dunes was also checked. None held any clues for investigators. Posters were distributed and tips were followed, but all led nowhere. In October of 1974, the woman, who had become known as the Lady of the Dunes, was laid to rest in St. Peter's Cemetery. Her headstone read, Unidentified Female Doe, found Race Point Dunes, July 26, 1976. In the years that followed, generations of investigators worked on the woman's case. Clay reconstructions were created. It was theorized that she may have even been the victim of South Boston gangster James Whitey Bulger, but he couldn't be connected to the case. A mob hit was investigated, but no evidence of one could be found. Local motorcycle gangs were questioned, and ground-penetrating radar was used at the site. Even psychics were consulted. Nothing was leading anywhere. A killer in Maryland even confessed to her murder, but he was discounted as a person of interest. Some on the police force theorized that the woman was foreign. That would explain most of their difficulty in finding out who she was, but no evidence of her nationality could be found. In 1980, her body was exhumed and blood samples were taken. Then, in 2000, she was exhumed again at the behest of a woman who claimed that she might be the Lady of the Dunes' mother. DNA samples were taken, but it turned out that the woman was not her mother. In 2006, age regression photos were produced to aid in their search, and in 2010, Nekmec created a more advanced 3D composite image. Leads kept being checked, but still, they were no closer to finding the woman's identity or who had killed her. The most well-known speculation on this case actually came from writer Stephen King's son, Joe Hill. While watching Jaws, he noticed an extra in one of the scenes that he felt could be the Lady of the Dunes. At the time she was killed and found, Jaws was filming in this area. We also know the Lady of the Dunes was alive in June and that the filming of Jaws was a big deal locally. Lots of folks turned up to try to get a peek at the stars or the shark or to see if they could sneak into a shot, he speculated. Theories on social media ran rampant with differing opinions. Records from the film were reviewed, but 
they didn't list the extra's name. It was also found that the film's casting director had since died, so although this speculation brought many more eyes to the case, it offered no real leads. Soon, the Lady of the Dunes would be the oldest unidentified homicide victim in Massachusetts history. In 2022, Othram Labs was brought in on the investigation. They were given some of the woman's skeletal remains in order to help develop a full DNA profile. Once that was developed, the sequence was entered into a genealogical database in an effort to find any relatives, and they found a match. A woman named Marilyn Renee Hill had entered her DNA into a genealogy site in an effort to find her sister, Ruth Marie Terry. Marilyn had searched for her sister for many years, but never found any trace of her. Ruth was never officially reported as missing. Sadly, Marilyn passed away in 2021, but her family still wanted answers, and now the world was about to learn that the Lady of the Dunes was indeed Ruth Marie Terry. Ruth was born in Whitwell, Tennessee in 1936. She left home as a teenager to travel and to see the U.S. She was known to travel and have ties in California, Massachusetts, and Michigan. Ruth was a gentle, caring person who also loved to sing. Her red hair and blue eyes always stood out in a crowd. Not much more is known about the time that she disappeared, but we do know that when she traveled to Michigan, she had been married and was then separated from her husband. Her name at that time was Ruth Smith. Investigators also found that she had used the aliases Terry Marie Vitzina, Terry M. Vitzina, and Terry Shannon. The last time her family spoke with her was about four months before her murder. She had shown up at the family home in Tennessee with a new husband, a man named Guy Rockwell Moldavin. The two were married only a month before in Reno, Nevada. Moldavin was also found to have used several aliases himself in his life. They included Raul Guy Rockwell and Guy Moldavin Rockwell. Her family felt uneasy when around him. They stated that when Ruth was with him, she was almost inaccessible, like he owned her, and she was his property. Months after their visit, Moldavin contacted the family to tell them that his then 37-year-old wife was missing, and they never heard anything from the couple again. Family members hired a private investigator in California who tracked down some of her possessions. He found that she had sold them all just before leaving the state. Moldavin has a very sketchy past. He was married to his first wife only briefly. The two were running an antique shop in Seattle, Washington, when Moldavin met Manzanita Mearns. Shortly after, he kicked his wife out, divorced her, and married Manzanita. In 1960, she and her daughter, Dolores, were reported missing. Moldavin was accused of killing them both. When their house and their grounds were searched, investigators found human remains in a septic tank on their property. Moldavin became their prime suspect, but soon he fled Seattle. Before fleeing, he divorced Manzanita under a desertion charge and married his third wife. After a nationwide manhunt, he was found hiding in New York by the FBI. No one was ever charged in those two deaths. He faced larceny charges when he cheated his third wife's family out of $10,000. He was convicted for that in 1961 and ordered to serve 15 years. But in 1962, a judge suspended his sentence with the stipulation that he had to repay the money. Now, we know he's connected to the Lady of the Dunes and might even be responsible for what happened to her. Can investigators question him? Unfortunately, not. He died in Salinas, California at the age of 78 back in 2002. Although Moldavin has not been officially named her killer, and while he's a compelling person of interest considering his history, there's always the possibility that someone else did this. Investigators are still asking for any information people might have about Ruth, Moldavin, and her murder. District Attorney Michael O'Keefe said it's very likely that the person who did this is dead, but they may not be. And so the message to them, if they're still out there, is, we're coming. Officials are asking anyone with information related to the case to call the Massachusetts State Police at 1-800-527-8873, or you can email tips to msptips at pol.state.gov.
www.ma.us. You can also contact the FBI's toll-free tip line at 1-800-CALL-FBI. That's 1-800-225-5324. Or submit online tips to them at tips.fbi.gov. At a news conference recently, Ruth's family talked about finally finding their relative and the impact that it's had on them. They want everyone to know that she was loved, was beautiful, and that Ruth deserves justice. Her great niece, Brittany Novonglowski, recently said during an interview, it was just earth shattering to know that somebody so beautiful and so loved and so bright was taken like that. She was just brutalized and left that way with no dignity. It's very, very sad for us because she was up there for 50 years all by herself. Thankfully, she can now be remembered by her surviving family since the mystery of who is the Lady of the Dunes is a case cracked. I would like to thank the New York Times, Fox News, FBI.gov, CBS News, BNCBoston.com, Boston25News.com, TheCalifornian.com, The Cape Cod Times, and Yahoo.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case. And here she is now to discuss it with us. Christy, this is a case that I wasn't sure would be solved, but thankfully, here we are. I know, and another one for Othram, right? Seriously, like they are just knocking it out of the park. <laughs> and, you know, I'm glad that they got a case of kind of, of this level, a little more popular. I mean, I think we just need to bring them into the public mindset a little more. And a case like this is certainly going to help. Honestly, like yeah. I, I need to buy some of their stock or something because this is like <laughs> they're doing a great job. Um, if Moldavan did do this, mm -hmm. there's a very good chance that this would at least be the third victim that we know about. Now, admittedly, he doesn't have a conviction on the first two, but we have remains that were found at the home that they were living at. He was being investigated heavily. They just it sounds like they couldn't prosecute the case, lack of evidence. Yeah. Um, well, and from what I can see, he had at least five wives. I counted more around seven in uh, my head. So, well, and if he did this, if we're correct, once again, uh, but if he did do this, that would be two of his wives and a stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. Who knows how many girlfriends? Um, there's no telling how many people this guy's connected to. There's really not. And this one feels like another one of those cases where the killer should have been caught the first time, but just let go due to lack of evidence. Honestly, that's one of the most frustrating things about this case. You get this guy actually sentenced. Now, admittedly, it's not for a murder charge or something like that. Mm -hmm. He's sentenced for taking one of his wife's money. But how does that sentence get suspended a year later? You'd think that if the judge had known you know, like, don't they have a record that they have to look at and say, oh, well, this guy's a person of interest in a double homicide case out of this other state. Maybe that 15 year conviction should, maybe we should just let that sit for a little bit. Like how, like, it's almost got me wondering about the possibility of some type of mob or mafia connection. Like, did someone pull a string and, hey, judge, you got to get our buddy out? Like, I don't know, but this is it's really, really strange. I don't understand it. Just like, oh, he's he's going to promise to pay it back. Well, then go ahead and let him out. I know that seemed ridiculous to me. I know it was a different time, but yeah, he's going to pay. No big deal. Yeah. It's it's ridiculous. And no, I didn't find anything about the mob, only just that mention that they looked into mob hits. Okay. But while we're speaking about the family, there was another family member that was affected by all of this. Okay. Now, let me read this so I can make sure I get it all right. Richard Hanchett never met his mother, Ruth Marie Terry. She chose to have him adopted right after he was born in 1958, entrusting him to a couple who worked with her at a plant that made door panels and seat covers for cars in Michigan. She was oh, 21 years old at the time. I didn't even think about the possibility that she had kids out there as well. I didn't either. Mm. I didn't either. But, you know, in 2018, hoping to find her, Mr. Hanchett took a DNA test through Ancestry.com and met her family in Tennessee. Wow. That's, yeah, that's when he figured out that they'd been looking for her for decades. And what a blow, you know, yeah. you're ready to meet your mother and to see this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that is amazing. So has that, 
it, it's confirmed then because he's been connected back to the family. Do they do another additional analysis to confirm that he is oh, actually yes. hurt? Okay. okay. Oh, yes. They did another one. It's confirmed. He's Ruth's son. Yeah. Wow. And he said, I can't believe when I found out or I couldn't believe when I found out who she was. And now I'm finding out where she was and what happened. How sad. Yeah, that's got to be something else. Like, it's one thing to hear that, oh, wow, my mother disappeared and none of the family knows where she is. But then it being tied up in the lore, the, the lore of this case, like this case became something. It's it's like one of those in terms of Jane Doe cases. Mm -hmm. Top 10 easy, maybe top five for a lot of people, just in terms of, of how mm -hmm. well it's known. Um, Yeah, that's that's unbelievable. That's got to have some well, crazy emotions. With it. it does. And there's so much guilt wrapped up in it, too. He also said that Ruth tried to contact him when he was about 13 years old, but he rejected it. And now he just deeply regrets it. Yeah. Uh, I hope he doesn't hold on to that too deeply because that's, I mean, you know, you're 13 years old and you're dealing with the feelings of, you know, having a parent leave you behind. And mm -hmm. yeah, I hope he doesn't hold on to that. To, or Which that he gets some help in terms of dealing with that. He, oh, that's, that's terrible. It's terrible. It is. So she's been given her name back. Uh, obviously, that comment from her niece, great niece, I think, uh, was talking about how hurtful it was that she was up there all alone for 50 years. They're, yeah. they're obviously talking about the grave. So are they going to move her? What happens with her remains now? Yes. Richard has said that he's hoping to have her reburied next to their parents in Tennessee. Oh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. It seems like the family's upset about that aspect as well. Just that she has been so far from, from where the family is. Well, I'm glad they're. I would, I would be. Yeah. That, that always bothers me in these Jane and John Doe cases to know that these people are without their families or anyone that they knew. They're just, that's why I love that they're being found out. They're not forgotten anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Big thank you to Authram for taking care of that. And of oh, course, yes. a big thank you to you, Christy. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all your hard work on today's episode. I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Jennifer Wilson and Hugh Cavallero. Since 2015, we have always run limited commercial ads for the benefit of the viewers and the families that we're trying to help. Obviously, we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help, please visit lordnarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Kelly Turk recently did. We really appreciate your support on our mission to run as few ads as possible and help as many cases as we can. Remember, you can get another Lord Nart story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below so you never miss an upload. Also, if you want to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows, be sure to check the description box below for our new channel link, Lord and Art Studio 2. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.